Good evening and praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Bible study here at New Psalmist Baptist Church. Glad to have you joining us in our virtual space, our virtual classroom, virtual sanctuary, whatever you want to call it. But this is the virtual campus of New Psalmist, and together we're sharing in the Word tonight. Every week we get a chance to come together on our Thursday nights and, and deal with not just the Word of God, but the message that was birthed on Sunday morning and how it continues to live come alive and grow more and more in our hearts and in our spirits throughout the week. And so tonight I get a chance to share from the message that Bishop shared on Sunday um, about or rather coming from Revelation 9, 12 and the title he preached was he should have quit when he was ahead. So we're going to dive into just the book of Revelation a little more tonight. But I want you to do me a favor first. We're going to open in prayer. But I want you to hit that share button or send a text message to somebody, invite somebody else to join you in and even greet those who are in the room with you. One of the things I love about the New Psalmist virtual experience is that when we go back and we watch the replays, what have you, and we look at the analytics, we get to see how members and, and community uh, guests of New Psalmist are connecting and engaging with each other right in our virtual spaces. So go ahead and greet people as they're coming in. You may see that name, that, that username that you talk to every week Come on, tell them good evening. Let them know you're glad to see them. This is still church. We are still the body of Christ and we are still connected even in the virtual space. That means you can talk back and give an amen, a hallelujah, a high five emoji, all that good stuff because we grow together. We learn together. We live together and we continue to be discipled together one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is what I want to do. We're going to pray. I'm going to share a couple of things and we're going to hop into tonight's study. So let's go to God in prayer. Father and our God, we thank you right now for this time, this space that you've given us to grow in your word and to become more like Christ. We thank you for allowing us to have this place in this space to study, to learn, and to really take in what it is you are showing to us and revealing to us through this Bible that we, that we thank you and we believe that your word and your message for us dwells in it. Now, God, sanctify this time in this space. In Jesus' name, we say amen. So invite persons. We thank you for doing that. Sharing the service, we thank you for doing that. Let me remind you, though, this Sunday, we have Baptism Sunday. We're going to be baptizing new believers in worship. We also have the kickoff of Black History Month. And for this first Sunday, it is our Heritage Sunday. What we do every year at New Psalmist is we do take one of the, at least one of the Sundays to celebrate our history and our culture as a people. And so we adorn ourselves in the garments and the attire that points back to our native land. And so we'd love for you this Sunday to come dressed in your African attire, your kente, your dashikis, whatever it may be. We'd love for you to join us as we celebrate our history and our heritage and our culture as, a, as African American people on this Sunday in worship. But each week we have a theme. We have our, our heritage this week, next week, we're celebrating and lifting up health. And on that second Sunday, I'm going to ask you to come dressed comfortably because we're going to be moving in worship. We're going to be putting our bodies to work. So we want you to dress comfortably. That, that may be the week you leave the suit home, the pantyhose home, and you come dress comfortably. Yes, church appropriate, of course, but come dress comfortably for worship because we're going to be moving as we emphasize health and wellness on that second Sunday physical health, mental health, emotional health. We've got some things planned. You'll hear more about them on Sunday about some of our partners who are going to be joining us in worship on that day as well. The third Sunday, we're calling it kind of an HBCU Sunday, but more broadly, it is an education Sunday because everybody didn't attend the HBCU. We're going to be doing an emphasis on our historically black colleges and universities, but we want to celebrate education overall. So whatever your alma mater is, we want you to represent on that day. If you're in elementary, high school, middle school, represent for your school. If you're part of a Divine Nine organization, Greek letter organization, represent for them on that way because we're going to be lifting up education for the next generation. We're going to have some schools here that are taking applications and helping students understand how they get prepared for higher education. It's going to be a great time in worship and after worship as well. And then on the final Sunday, we're saluting our history. The black church experience is a unique one and it has transformed throughout the years. And on that Sunday, we're going to be showing kind of our, our history and tradition as a people. 
when, 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 when black people were brought to this country, and not by our own will or volition, but we were forcibly brought to this country, one of the things that sustained us was when we understood our faith, not a faith that was presented to us, a narrative of Jesus presented to us, but when we began to understand who God is for us and our people and our context, out of that is the birthing of the black church. The black church experience is one that is very unique. We often see it mimicked in theater and arts, but it's something about it to us that has helped us become who we are today. And so we're going to be helping to share that black church tradition on the fourth Sunday, asking you to come dressed like traditional church dress. Your suit and tie, your, your good Sunday hat if you got one. We're going to wear it on that Sunday as we celebrate our history and our culture. That's going to lead us into what we're calling Black History University. And on that last week of February, we're going to be having online virtual classes about the history of the black church, preserving our history, about African-American traditions, and about the history of voting rights. Four different nights, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to keep the history of our people alive in a day and age where history and truth seem to be under attack. We want to make sure that our church, our community, our children, that they know the truth about who we are and how far God has brought us and is continuing to lead us this far by faith. So it's a lot going on this month. It's the first day of February today. There's a lot we have planned throughout the month, and I hope you can join us for all, many if not all, of these things. And we're also kicking off our connection groups this month. And you can register right now on the Church Center app to get connected to brothers and sisters here at New Psalmist Baptist Church. There's a full listing of groups for men, women, couples, singles, young adults, youth. I mean, it's something for everybody. So you wanna to go to the Church Center app or call the church office and find out more about our connection groups right here. But now, I wanna get into tonight's, tonight's lesson. And again, I shared the title that Bishop used Sunday, He Should Have Quit When He Was Ahead, from Revelation 12, 10 through 14, and Bishop gave a, a dynamic message. If you haven't seen it, weren't here on our YouTube channel, it's there. Go watch the replay, be blessed by the word. But, but the scripture that he came from was from Revelation 12, verses 10 through 14. And, and it got me thinking about the book of Revelation and how for some of us, traditionally, it has kind of been a book we don't touch because it is an apocalyptic book in its nature. It speaks to the end times of what will be. And it was presented, at least in my youth, um, as kind of the spooky book of the Bible. It, it, it uses language that can, can cause you to get a little eerie of this is how it's gonna be in the end, this is stuff that's lying ahead. And folk get a little nervous sometimes when you talk about the book of Revelation. The, the, the unknown of it all. Is it figurative? Is it literal? Um, are there actually going to be beasts in the air and dragons and fights and warring of angels and what have you? And so I kind of want to break down some of that tonight and get into the book itself in our time of studying. And, and even before I do that, though, let me thank you for now in advance for those who are giving, even as we're in a Bible study right now, already giving online your Bible study offerings. Thank you for sowing into the ministry. Um, when we look at the Bible itself as a whole, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is kind of a mirror image of each other in that in the Old Testament is breaking down. You start with the books of history, um, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the, 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 uh, Pentateuch the, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the ones that we attribute to Moses. Those are the books of law. And from that, you then go into the books of history. You go from law, history, poetry, and prophecy. So those are the, the categories in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it is a similar breakdown, kind of mirroring it, but not under the exact same categories. So how you have hist or rather law starting out the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you have the Gospels. The law is the foundation for the Old Covenant, Jesus being the foundation for the New, his sacrifice. And so the Gospels begin to help us see his life, to know about him walking on the earth, the things that he did. In the Old Testament, it goes from law to history. New Testament, gospels to history, the acts of the apostles. 
giving us the history of how it is these followers of Christ move and operate it in their carrying out of the gospel. You have then after that, you get into the epistles and the New Testament. So you go in Old Testament, law, history, poetry, prophecy. The New Testament, you go from gospels, history, epistles, which are the letters, the writings, which are, I guess, kind of the mirror of the poetry of the Old Testament. In the epistles, you have the Pauline epistles, you have the pastoral epistle, which is the book of Hebrews, and then you have the general epistles. And then you have the book of Revelation, which is the mirroring of the prophecy of the Old Testament. You have major and minor prophets in the Old Testament that close it out. In the New Testament, you have this book of prophecy, this book of the apocalyptic, of what is to come. Revelation closing out the New Testament. So the two testaments are formed and structured in such a way that they mirror each other in their layout. And in the New Testament, it ends with this prophetic book speaking to what shall be, speaking to what is to come. And that is the book of Revelation, not Revelations, which folks sometimes say in church, there's no S because it's one revelation. It is the book of Revelation that is given to John while he's on the Isle of Patmos. And this revelation is about what shall be in the end. The vision given to him about how in the end God will be victorious. So let's look at the author itself. John, the apostle. We know a bit about him. He, we know a bit about him throughout the Bible. We see him going through all of from the Gospels all the way now uh, to the end book of Revelation. John has a presence throughout the different categories and areas, if you will, of the New Testament. John is in the Gospels, John is in Acts, John has epistles, and John is the author of this prophetic book, the apocalyptic book, the book Revelation. So John is throughout the New Testament, but he is first presented to us as this apostle, this follower of Jesus Christ, this one who answers the call when Jesus says to follow me. John is one of the ones closest to Jesus. He, he is the one who... The Bible says the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he has a close relationship with him. But again, we see him as a author of the fourth gospel, which is the most uh, Christocentric gospel. It is the one that has its purpose and its emphasis of being to help people understand that Jesus was not just a man, that Jesus was not just a prophet, that he was not just sent by God, but that he is God. That, that, that is the crux of what John is helping us to understand in his gospel. It is heavily Christocentric. But again, we see him as writing the fourth gospel. He writes three previous epistles, first, second, and third John, and he writes Revelation. In his gospel, it is where we find the I am statements of Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door, that I and the Father are one. We find these things in John's gospel, because he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the one who has a close relationship with him. Yes, they all have different relationships, but something about John's relationship was he was special. And that, that is why he pushes so hard that people really know who Jesus is, that he is the word made flesh. Look at how John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's his mission statement, his credo, his thesis for his book. Jesus is God. So, but he's been with him from, since the beginning, since the early days, rather, of his ministry. When Jesus is walking the earth, John is there. He's been there, a part of the faith since the beginning. And he's also now the one whom God chooses to see the end. He's been there in the beginning, one of the ones called by Jesus Jesus called him by his name. Now he's at the end of the book as the one God has chosen to reveal what the end shall be. It shows us the power of relationship. It shows us that when you know who God is, you have a relationship with God, God will allow you to see some things. Maybe even some things that others themselves do not see. God will expose you and allow you to experience him in unique and special ways. 
Our theme at New Psalmist for the past two years has been experiencing God. And to really experience God, there has to be a relationship with God. The Bible shows us a few times those whom have relationship with God, how it is they are exposed and experienced to who God is. If you think of the story of Moses and Moses being the, the great figure of the Old Testament, Moses being the one who leads the people out of captivity in Egypt and into the promised land. He has an experience with God. He, he, he serves God, has relationship. And because of that, he has an experience where he gets to see the glory of God. He gets to see God's glory. If you have your Bible with you, or maybe you're taking notes, Exodus 33 is where I, I want to draw your attention. Exodus 33 verses 12 through 20. This is what it says. It says, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name. You found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How can anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I'll do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. So God exposes Moses and passes in front of him in his presence. I'll see. I'll have, he says, you will see. I will pass in my goodness to pass in front of you and proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. You will see something that the average, ordinary, local yokel doesn't see. You, you, you will see something that everybody is not privy to. Moses sees this because God has found favor with him, because he is pleased with him. That relationship, that connection, that fellowship, when we know God for ourselves, personal relationship, God exposes us to some things. Okay, maybe you need more than one example. Maybe you need a second source. That we in Bible study, so we get to go in the Bible. First Kings 19. First Kings 19. Here we find the story of the prophet Elijah. And Elijah is faithful in his service. Elijah is a bad boy. Let me tell you, Elijah stands up to any and everybody on God's behalf and will speak the word of God even when he is standing up to power or standing up to opposition that can surely take him out. He trusts in the Lord, his God, that much. He trusts God in such a way that he experiences God for himself. First Kings 19, this is what it says, starting at verse number nine. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me, too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain, in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God was not in the loud sounds of the of the winds and the waves, the earthquakes rather and the fire, but he came in the still small whisper. God made his presence known. Elijah got to experience God in that moment. That's a couple Old Testament examples. Let me give you a New Testament one about how that relationship with God 
allows you to experience God in special and unique ways. Flipping your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, those first three verses, we find these words. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Y'all know who John is, the writer of Revelation, the man we're talking about tonight. Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So just the three of them go with Jesus, not everybody else. All our relationships are different. Not saying that one's better than the other, but I'm saying that God exposes us to that which we, or he knows we, can handle. Because all of us can't handle too much of God at the same time. We've got to grow to certain points and places that we can receive a receive the revelation of who he is for us in that season. So it says he took them up the mountains by the high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. On the mountain, they have a revelation. They are, they are exposed to who Jesus really is, the goodness and the greatness of our Lord and Savior. They get to see what nobody else sees because of relationship. And one thing we must be mindful of in this day and age where there's so many people who want to be the own self-prescribers of their spiritual faith and walk, their religious journey, who want to be the ones that diagnose and give prognosis to how it is they ought to grow spiritually. The reality is this, that there's something different when you have your own genuine, healthy relationship. Not the one you're trying to piecemeal together by things you learned on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, but one that has been cultured and nurtured, one that has been cultivated even by those whom God has sent to help you grow and develop and to help you become. Peter, James, and John end up on that Mount of the Transfiguration, <clears throat> having walked with Jesus, having listened to him, and having it taken root in them in such a way that they are chosen to be exposed in this moment. This is the, what happens when we walk with God, when we have relationship with God, when we have shown that God can trust us with not just being faithful, but trust us with who he is, that we will not waste it, that we will not uh, let it fall void, but that we might take it and run with it, that it might enhance the lives of somebody else. Because it's the same John who's on the mountain of transfiguration that sees Jesus revealed, who writes that fourth gospel wanting the world to know that Jesus is God, who writes or who receives this revelation and shares what the end will be like. John, who is the author, finds himself on the island of, island of Patmos. Bishop on Sunday began to talk about what that island means for us today and how it is we see that we are still dealing with the Isle of Patmos in our own lives. But to speak about the context in which John is writing, he's on this island because he has been exiled. He has been banished to the island of Patmos. He's been banished by the emperor of the time. The emperor's name is, is Domitian, D-O-M-A-T-I-A-N. That is the emperor at this time. And likely this is not his first time he has tried to punish John. That the reign of this emperor is not one that is filled with con conflict. It is a rather peaceful time, but the emperor himself is a paranoid man. And because of that, he seeks out those whom he feels are a threat to his dominion and his power. John being one of those as an apostle and a follower of Christ, the preacher of the gospel. And there is this story not found in the biblical text but one that is written by authors of that time and scholars of that time and historians of that time, most notably Tertullian, who was a Christian writer and theologian. He writes of an incident, again, it's not described, you won't find this from Genesis to Revelation, 
but you will find this in different writings around the time. He writes, and there's even artwork to depict this moment. He writes of the emperor taking John and putting him into a vat of boiling hot oil in an attempt to punish him, in an attempt to ultimately take him out. And the, I'll say the myth of the story, if you will, because again, I'll call it a myth because it's not in this book. I, I will say it is maybe an exaggeration. I do not know. The report that is given is that John continued to preach in the vat of oil. And because that did not take him out, he is now exiled to the Isle of Patmos. He now has to spend time on the island isolated, uh, pulled away from those to whom he would preach and speak and lead for his time of exile. That is why he's on the island of Patmos. He is guilty of preaching the gospel and spreading the message of Jesus Christ. He even writes this in chapter one, verse nine. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That is what has sent him here. He is exiled because he's been preaching, exiled because he's been spreading the gospel, exiled for being on the Lord's side. And so Patmos, where he's been exiled to, it's about 10 miles long, six miles wide at its north end. It is a mountain that's terrain is rocky it has some volcanic hills. That is how it is described. It's one of the Aegean islands that was used by the Romans for political prisoners. So that is what John is seen as, a political prisoner. We look at it, we say John is arrested and, and locked up for preaching Jesus. But he's preaching, and this is why he's a political, pr pr political prisoner. He's preaching to what power sees as a threat to their power. He's preaching to what Rome sees as a threat to their authority, which makes John a political prisoner because he's coming against their position, their power, their authority. And so they have him now banished to Patmos. Patmos would have been one of likely three islands they use to send these political prisoners, but they send John to Patmos. So they try to silence him by shutting him off. They try to silence him by disconnecting him from those who would have been the listening ears to his message and to the gospel he was preaching. That is how they have set him up and ended, and ended up now being on this island of Patmos. But it is there that God decides to send him this revelation. It is there that God decides to speak to him and reveal to him and to pour into him all that is written in this book. One of the things that amazes me is how God can continually take places, seasons, situations, predicaments that ultimately should have us in a place where we feel broken, abandoned, alone, depressed. And those are the very places where God says, you are now positioned for me to open your ears open your eyes that I might speak, that I might show, that you might hear, that you might see what I have in store. It, it's just crazy to me how God works in that way, that in our human experience, we'll be down and depressed. But spiritually, God is pouring into us, charging us up for what it is the next leg of the journey holds for us. Because John's journey does not end on Patmos. He actually goes on to pastor a church in Ephesus and lead there. But in, in, or on this island, in captivity, in exile, banished away from everybody, this is where God says, I'm going to pour out into you that you might write, that you might write and send out messages to churches, that you might write and send out the call to the church of today, yep, today and tomorrow of what shall be in this experience, in this, in this journey of life. And so when we get to the content of the revelation that John receives on Patmos, it starts out with letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. If you look at Revelation, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn in my physical Bible tonight. If you look at Revelation and how it starts out, when you get to chapter two, you start seeing 
and this is in the NIV version. You, you'll see these hitters in the NIV. You may not see them in King James or other translations because, of course, when the Bible was originally written, there are no chapter and verse and headings. It's just all one scroll for books. And so it's broken down by editors and redactors to help us in our reading and understanding of the book. But when you look at the headings, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Smyrna, to the church in Pergamum, to the church in Thyatira, to the church in Sardis, to the church in Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, PA, Philadelphia in this time, to the church in Laodicea. He's writing to these different churches in Asia Minor. He's telling them what they need because right now these churches are all under persecution. They're all in places and spaces where people are coming after them. The early days of the church were not singing, shouting hallelujah. The church was constantly under attack because the message of Jesus Christ was threatening to people whose livelihood was using the law of Moses to oppress people, using the scripture and the tradition and the history of it all to make people feel as though they were not enough and they had to keep giving more to something else. And so when you show up and you're now freeing people from bondage, you're liberating folk, you are a threat to power. So the church was constantly under attack in this early days, in this beginning. And so Paul, John, rather, is writing to these churches who are being persecuted. And in chapter one, verse nine, he says, I'm a companion in your suffering. The churches have their afflictions that they're facing because of their faithful witness. And each church is facing something. But God gives John a word for each of these churches. So chapters two and three contain these messages to these churches to whom John is writing. And then we get past chapter three and now we move into the part that, that sometimes, you know, oh, we get spooky now because we start getting the visions of the end. Starting at, at chapter four, we start seeing now these words that speak to the vision John has received of not what has been and not what is, but what shall be. He begins talking about these different things that if you were to just read through it at face value, it can be a little confusing. It can be a little eerie. But when you begin to dive into what John is seeing, what God is showing him and how it speaks to what shall happen in the end, it's truthfully not something we should run from. It's something we should run towards to really understand and to help us get a grasp of a sign of the times. I heard a preacher say some years ago, rather not some, it was maybe last year or year before that. So some years ago, maybe two years ago, talking about everything that was happening in our world today. And you'll hear folk often say, oh, these are the end times. Oh, these are the end times. We're living in the end times. When the Bible told us no man shall know the day nor the hour. So we don't know when the end times are. But you'll hear folk say that. And the preacher said this, said, I don't know if these are the end times. But these sure look like the times of the end. This sure looks like stuff that is spoken of in the Bible that will be the precursor to the returning of our Lord and Savior. Some of that is what we find, not just in the word of Jesus and the gospel, what we find in John's revelation. It gives us a glimpse of things that we should be aware of, not necessarily to let us know that Jesus is coming tomorrow, but to make us aware and cognizant of how it is we are carrying ourselves. Not saying that we're bound to the law, but I would say this. If Jesus were to come back tomorrow, would you be pleased with the state he found you in? Would you be pleased with the current condition of your life if he were to come back tomorrow? And so sometimes knowing and seeing the signs of the times allows us to check ourselves and ask, am I in the condition in the state right now that I'm ready for when Jesus comes back and sees me, I'm proud of what I present before him. Some of you can relate to this moment where you may have somebody who's getting in your car who normally does not ride with you. Normally you, you ride everywhere by yourself. You drive by yourself and somebody says, hey, I'm a ride with you. Do you sometimes have to go out and check your car and make sure that thing is clean? Make sure you don't have receipts all over the place and water bottles and clothes and shoes slung all over the place. You go out there and make sure it's tight so that when they get in, it's presentable. Can I suggest to you tonight that sometimes the signs of the times 
are to make sure that we've got ourselves presentable so that if he's coming back now or not, I'm presentable. I'm looking and ready and living in such a way that when he's looking at me, whether it's face to face by him reappearing or he was looking at me from somewhere I do not know, but I know he's present. He's pleased with what he sees. And I am putting on an accurate representation of who I am and who I have become in Jesus Christ. And so in this book, we begin to see signs of what shall be and even signs of what we experience in life today. The language that John uses at certain points can be a little bit off putting. But when you start hearing John talk about beasts and, and, and talking about angels with all these eyes on them. The other day I, I used this uh, graphic creating um, AI program online and I put in there. Show me or create a picture of what the angel looks an angel looks like as described in the Bible. And it generated some photos for me and put them up on my screen. And, and I want to tell you, all when it put that picture up, it made me understand now when angels show up in the Bible, they say fear not. Because them things did not look like the flowing ethereal creatures that we see in film and media of angels. But one of the descriptions given here is an angel that has six wings and an angel that is covered with eyes all over it. Can you imagine being Joseph and you sleep and you wake up and all you see is a bunch of eyes staring at you? The first thing that angel got to say is fear not. Because because that's a, that's a scary situation. Seeing that thing pop up in front of you like that. And so the language that we see him using in some cases we have to see, OK, is this literal or is this figurative? Is he speaking of what actually shall be or is he helping us understand a a vision that is difficult to comprehend because it is given by God. So he's doing his best to use human language to describe divine revelation. Because sometimes we are prisoners to our language and confined to our language. So we have to find the best way to verbalize and articulate what God is showing us. So some some cases it is descriptive language and others. This is what's going to be. But he's finding the words to describe the things of God. Sometimes it's hard to comprehend. Sometimes sounds strange trying to really put into words what God is revealing to you. But it, but it, but ultimately, because I'm not going to dive into it all tonight. We ain't got that much time for one Bible study. And I want to keep you here all night long. I know you might have a pot roast in the oven. You don't want it to burn. Your good show about to come on. Don't worry. Pastor going to be there in a second. And so I'm not going to dive into everything that John talks about. I mean, you can look and read through it. And he talks about the great multitude, talks about those in white robes, talks about seeing those who are coming from the gates in the city. And then he sees a number no man can number, talks about a new heaven and a new. Oh, oh he talks about all these good things. Yes. Talks about the battle that shall take place. But at the end of it all, what does John tell us? God is victorious. At the end of it all, what does John tell us in this revelation that he's give, that God has given him of how things shall be? In the end, he tells us our God wins. Makes me wonder sometimes why are we fearful of victory? If the contents of this book conclude with God being victorious, there's no need for us to fear what lies ahead. There's no need for us to be worried about what we would read through. When we know in the end, we've, we've already got the cliff notes of how the story is going to end. So we ought not mind getting there, even going through the difficult moments of the story, even going through the tribulation of the story, even going through the trials of the story. And, and the story, I mean, by John's revelation, if we know how it ends, ending being victorious for God and for his children and his church, then we ought not fear of that. I think sometimes we are fearful of victory because in order to be victorious, you have to have a foe. You have to have a fight. And you have to accept the finality of it all. In order for there to be victory, that means there's got to be a foe. There's something, someone you have to be victorious over. 
There has to be a foe and there has to be a fight. Some of us have been fighting so long, we don't feel like fighting anymore. You, you feel like uh, Miss Sophia in the color purple. All my life I had to fight. You're tired of fighting. And so when it comes to the things of the spirit, I, I'll just let whatever God brings my way bring, come my way. I don't want to read about no more fighting. And so there's a foe, there's a fight, and there's a finality of it all, knowing that things will come to an end. And I had to grow to this point where I myself was no longer fearful of that part, the finality of things. Because knowing in all things, everything that has a beginning has an ending. But also knowing that if I know Jesus for myself, the finish on this side is the beginning on the other side. The ending on this side is not the ending of it all because the next chapter is new life in Jesus Christ. See, when we have funerals in the church experience and in having a relationship with Jesus Christ, we call them celebrations of life because we celebrate this portion of their life. And we also celebrate the new beginning of their now life eternal. And so that is something that we ought not be fearful of. But sometimes finality is fearful because we fear the end. We fear saying goodbye. We fear anything being over. And so we fear victory because of the foe, the fight, the finality. The foe and the opposition that lies before us, the fighting ahead of us and the strain and the toil it will take. The finality is over. The chapter is ending. Everything has an ending to it. And even those things that we don't, we want them to end. Embracing that ending now has us asking the question, now what? What comes after this? What comes when this is over? But here is the blessing of not just revelation, but understanding the end of a thing in God. A victorious ending is not in vain. It is not like a video game that when you end, you win and it says game over the end you continue in what god has in store for you the path continues the journey continues even in death the journey continues because jesus said i came that you might have life and have it more abundantly to the full jesus came to restore us to the father that we might have everlasting life and so life continues for you and i even after death the victorious ending for us is not in vain we win so that we might carry forth the will and the way of God. We win so that the work of God might continue in and through us. And so in all things, even in the end, God has given us victory. So do not run from this book. Do not run from its, from its, uh, from its context. Do not run from its content. But allow yourself to take it in, take it on and understand what God is showing us, what God has shown to John in this revelation, what God is showing us for where we are today to truly understand the times we live. And when we see the signs to get ourselves together, to make ourselves to, to check and see, am I presentable or do I need to go and start cleaning some stuff up in the car? Have I allowed myself to get comfortable and now I got Big Mac wrappers and everything sitting up in here? Or am I still at a place where if Jesus came back today, I have no doubt in my mind I'd hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Yes, this book talks about the trumpets, the beast and the judgment and dragons. My Lord, what? dragons, what? But it's all helping us see in the end, God is victorious. So I, I would encourage and challenge each and every one of us, and, and maybe we'll do this together another time in our Bible study, to go through, spend some time reading the revelation of John that he received on that island called Patmos. Reading the revelation that John, and the word rather that John sent to those churches who were being persecuted in that time. Reading the revelation that God gave him of what the end will be. And in certain moments when life gets hard and gets tough, I would encourage you to revisit the victory because God tells us he will be victorious. In those moments in life 
where you feel as though you are being defeated, revisit the victory and remember your new identity of being an overcomer. Because the Bible says they triumphed over him by the blood and by the word of their testimony. When it's all said and done, victory belongs to Jesus. I don't want to give away the end. I don't want to give you a spoiler, but let me give you the spoiler. It's Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. A book that ends like that is a book that I want to read. I, I hope you are encouraged and empowered to embrace and take in that which God has given us to show us his ultimate victory over all things. Because we've been saying that all month, he's over it too. Listen, we're getting ready to leave out tonight, but if you haven't done so, and I'm gonna pray over it even now, we thank you for and encourage you, invite you to join us in giving tonight. God uses what you give to New Psalmist to allow us to do great and mighty things. As a matter of fact, during our Black History Month experience, we are going to be blessing others. And, and again, it's made possible because of your generosity and stewardship. We have a full missions outreach project that's going to be going on where we're giving away free Chromebooks, giving away free coats, shoes, free socks, free groceries, all of it made possible because of your stewardship, your generosity, your time, your service, your effort, your, your, your joining into the mission and vision of New Psalmist. So I want to ask if you would get that offering prepared on your giving devices, uh, GiveLify, uh, PushPay, Fellowship One. If you include it in your Sunday envelopes, thank you for your giving. You can give even now to be a blessing to the work in the ministry of New Psalmist Baptist Church. We're excited about what God is doing in this season of our ministry and what God is doing in this season of your life. So let's get ready to close out in prayer. We're going to pray over our offerings and pray as we go. Don't forget Sunday, wear your heritage attire. Father and our God, we thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you shall do. We thank you for how you've moved tonight, for how it is you've given us a time to come together and dive into your word, become more aware of your word and its purpose and power in our lives. God, right now, I thank you for being a God who has the final say. And when that say is given, it is that you win, that you are on the winning side. And as your children, we stand on the winning side with you. God, I pray tonight that something takes root in your people, in your children, that they might hold steadfast to what you've poured out, that they might declare, just as you show us in the end, that you are over it, they are over it. There's nothing our God cannot do. Now, God, I pray that you bless both gift and giver tonight and the seeds that are sown for the work of the ministry here at New Psalmist. And God, I pray that as we leave and log off from these places, you continue to make your presence known in our lives and everywhere we go in such a way that our, your light shines through us and others are drawn to you. Have your way in and through us in all things. And we'll continue to give you glory, honor and praise. In Jesus name, we all say Amen. Thank you again, New Psalmist. Can't wait to see you Sunday in your African heritage attire as we give God praise together one more time. Be blessed. See you Sunday at nine o'clock.